Isaiah chapter 9. Let me, uh, I, I went through this last week in a little bit more detail. I'll just paraphrase the context that we find this scripture in. Isaiah 9, we're going back 2,700 years ago. Anybody here ever watched that show growing up, The Magic School Bus? You know, the little kids got in a school bus and they went back in time. That's what I need you to do, okay? Right now, we're all kind of going in the magic school bus. We're gonna go back 2,700 years ago. Uh, the people of God, Israel, they were in a rough spot, uh, very rough. They were a divided kingdom, uh, quite literally. I mean, divisions in the land. You had a northern uh, community, a southern community, and they were at odds. Uh, on top of that, you have... Uh, rebellion in the hearts of the people, specifically rebellion to God. Uh, they were worshiping other gods. Uh, th there was oppression. They were oppressing the poor. Uh, this is stuff that God takes very seriously. And so what he does is he raises up the prophet Isaiah to come and to bring a message. And it was a hard message and a hopeful message. The hard part of the message in the beginning was that because of your rebellion and your oppression, uh, in all this stuff that's going on, he says, listen, it's going to get hard. The nations are going to rise up. They're going to conquer us. Now, that's not a, that's not a happy message, right? It, it's it's going to get difficult. But, but here's the hope. Here's the hope that God has not abandoned us. And this is the hope that we read in our banner verse, Isaiah 9, 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So this is the hard and the hope message he, he gives to Israel. It's, 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 we got hard days coming ahead, but there is hope. In fact, he's saying hope is on the way. The Messiah is on the way. The Savior's on the way, and he will be called. He's got titles, right? Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And, 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 and then it actually happened. 700 years after Isaiah prophesied this, Jesus came, right? The, the Messiah came, the Savior came. And, and that's really what this series is all about. What we're doing is we're looking at Jesus as the fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy. So far, we've looked at Jesus as the wonderful counselor. Last week, Jesus is the mighty God. Next week, we'll be concluding with Jesus as our prince of peace. But this week, this week, we come to the title that, if I'm being honest, intrigues me the most. And it's this, Jesus as our everlasting Father. Just repeat after me. Say, everlasting, everlasting. Father. Father. Come on, one more time like you mean it. Say, everlasting, everlasting. Father. Father. That's good. That's good. The, the reason why uh, this title, Everlasting Father, intrigues me the most is because it kind of seems like at first glance that Isaiah is confusing God the Son with God the Father, doesn't it? Like, doesn't it just kind of look like that? And so, so, so the question is, is he? Is Isaiah unclear on how the Godhead works? Is he confusing God the Son for God the Father? No. This is the good news, and you should read like a sigh of relief right there. No, he's not at, at, at all. In fact, 2,700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah didn't even have a space in his mind for a Trinitarian God. Uh, not at all. What, what, what's happening here, Isaiah is saying, and this is important that we understand this, kind of a twofold thing. Almost all theologians agree there's kind of a double meaning here. First, Isaiah is saying that the Messiah who's going to come is going to be father-like. His essence in his nature is going to reflect that of a father. And we see this in Jesus, right? Just look at how Jesus often references his disciples, right? He calls them his children, right? There's, a, there's an essence and a nature of Jesus that, that is father-like, but it's not just that. What, what, what it means that Jesus is the everlasting father is that he would come into the, into the world to reveal the heart 
of God the Father to us. Okay, so you have to understand, Isaiah's not saying that he is God the Father, he's saying that he comes to reveal the heart of the Father. In fact, I have one point that I'm gonna give us right now, and then we'll take some time and kind of break this down and talk about it. But if you're taking notes, just write this down, because this is like the one thing that I want us all to hit today, and it's this, that Jesus reveals to us the forever fatherly heart of God. Like this Christmas, we're, we're two weeks out, right? As we are now inching our way towards that date, what I want us to see right now is that Jesus reveals to us the forever fatherly heart of God. If you wanna know what God the Father is like, you just need to look at Jesus. If you wanna know how God the Father loves, you look at Jesus. If you wanna know the patience of God the Father, you look at Jesus. Why? Because Jesus came on that first Christmas to reveal to us the forever fatherly heart of God. That being said, I've been very blessed in my life. Um, my, my father, uh, who many of you knew, uh, he passed away uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I, I can't believe it's actually last month in November that it's been 15 years since my dad passed away. And, and, and I was incredibly blessed in my life because although my father was in no way perfect, he was present and he was loving. And in that way, I'm very blessed. But I also recognize that in a church of this size and with the hundreds and hundreds that are listening online right now, that there are some out there that that's not your story. I, I, I fully recognize that, that for some of you, when, when even as we explore this topic today and the word father comes up, right? Like that's uncomfortable. Maybe some of the deepest pain that you carry in your life is actually because of your relationship with your dad. Maybe he was just never there. Um, he abandoned the family at some point, or maybe he passed away while you were young, and there was just these milestones in your life that he was absent, right? Maybe he was physically there, but emotionally distant, so even to this day, when you call home and dad picks up the phone very quickly, he puts you over to mom because he still doesn't know how to handle that conversation. Maybe um, he was just always too busy and didn't really pay attention to you. Or sometimes in, in worse cases is that he was abusive, physically, sexually, dark stuff. And so when I stand up here, and I'm gonna give a message on how Jesus comes to reveal the heart of the Father. If you're honest, man, just that, that doesn't do much for you. In, in fact, maybe you even find that a little bit repulsive this morning because the word Father has such a negative meaning. It brings up, there's so much baggage associated with this. And so if that's you today, here's my prayer because I'm gonna do some teaching in a moment, but here's my prayer. That as we come to this topic, as we explore this, my prayer is that God would redeem the word Father for you. My, my, my honest prayer today, and I was thinking about this, my prayer is that we would learn not to view God through the lens of our earthly fathers, but rather that we would view our earthly fathers through the lens of God. We just kind of flip that around. My, my, my prayer is for all of us today, all of us, that, that, that God would reorient our hearts and our minds and our focus not on any current earthly figure at all, but on our heavenly one. Because it is true that Jesus comes to reveal the forever fatherly heart of God. So I just want to show you this. Okay, you ready? We were in Isaiah. Let's go New Testament. Flip over 700 years in your Bible. We're going to go to John chapter 14. Okay, 
John chapter 14, a uh, very important text that we have here. And here in this text, what's happening, Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples. He's talking about his soon departure, and then he shifts uh, the conversation and uh, kind of their focus onto God the Father. Let, let's, let's read. John 14, we'll pick it up in verse 1. Amazing passage right here. Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him. And see this, he says, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Okay, so here's what's happening. Jesus is at the Last Supper, and, and, and what he starts doing, right, is he's kind of unpacking for them the nature of his relationship with God the Father. And then Philip has the nerve, like the gall, the audacity, right, to then say this. He says, hey, Jesus, why don't you show us the Father, and then it will be enough for us. You know what, what's interesting? I'm just like, really, Philip? Like, really? <laughs> Would it? I mean, you have Jesus, son of the living God, standing right in front of you. The one who healed the blind and cleansed the, the, the lepers. The one who fed thousands with next to nothing, cast out demons, raised the dead. You have Jesus, son of God, right there. And Philip says, yeah, that's nice, but if you show us the Father, then we'll stop asking questions. <laughs> Listen to how Jesus responds, verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Okay, this is very important. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that 700 years ago, Isaiah was right. What he's saying is 700 years ago when Isaiah said that the one who would come would be the everlasting Father, he says, I'm it. Okay, I'm it. Not only am I fatherly in my essence and my nature, but I have also come to reveal the forever fatherly heart of God. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen him. He is, I, I love how uh, Colossians would say it this way. Colossians would say that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The author of Hebrews says that, that, that Jesus is the exact representation of his being. Jesus comes to reveal the forever fatherly heart of God for us. What I want to do is I want to explore for the next few moments together how. How does he do this? Now, there's probably way more ways than what I'm going to mention right now. I've got three that I want to lay out for us. Um, but I, I just want to give you three that were on my heart as we were walking into this message. How does Jesus reveal to us today the heart of the Father? Here's the first point. Write this down. Okay, ready? He provides for us. He provides for us. Like, th there's just something in the heart of parents to provide for their children. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that good parents are wealthy. 
And, and if you can leave a massive inheritance, that's how you, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that inside of, like God has put something inside of the heart of parents to provide. And so we work to that end, right? It's just something he's put on us. And this is also precisely what Jesus reveals about the father. Uh, listen to this, Luke 11, great text. Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Then he says this. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, some people don't think that Jesus was funny. I think Jesus was funny. I, I do. I mean, there's just these moments. And like here, there's this moment where Jesus says, yeah, well, think about it. Right? He says, like, like picture a little boy who comes up to his dad and says, Dad, can I have an egg? And the dad's like, no, here's a scorpion. You know, like, that's ridiculous. Like, it's, it's ridiculous, but the point we actually get, right? Jesus saying, even us, broken, sinful human beings, know that it's not smart to give our kids scorpions and snakes. He says, even we can understand that. He says, how much more will your heavenly Father give you exactly what you need and apparently what we need is more of him. Because that's what he says here. You gotta see every line. He says, how much more, Jesus says, how much more will God the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? God's ultimate provision that he promised here is not a home in clothes and food. Although I do believe that he provides those things, but that's not what he's talking about here. Here, the ultimate provision that God promises is more of himself. So he says, just ask. Just ask me. Just keep seeking. Just keep knocking. He says, I'm a good God who gives good things to my children, mainly myself. The provision that we all need in this room from God is more of God. And that's the very good news because that's what's on the table here. He gives himself. Man, I had, I had some friends, uh, specifically when I was in high school, I'm thinking of this one friend of mine, incredibly wealthy family, uh, incredibly wealthy. And I would go over to their house and it was fun, right? Because they had all the bells and whistles on everything. Every game, like their fridge just was like its own computer and doing stuff. And, it, and it was fun, and, and, and there was a part of me that was even jealous of that at that time. And then I would sit down, and I'd talk to that friend, and he would talk about his relationship with his father. And he'd say, like, man, I would give all of this up if he would just be here. What God offers, what God offers <laughs> is himself. The provision that God wants to bring is himself. And Jesus reveals this point. That, that's the first thing he provides for us. Here's the second thing. He defends us. He defends us. If you were to ask my kids, uh, Nora and Bo, who their protector is, they know exactly how to answer that. It's Jesus and daddy. It's true. I tell them. I, literally yesterday, I was saying it to my son, who's your protector? I say, Jesus and daddy. And I instill that into them, right? Because there's just something, man, that God has put in my heart as a father to defend, to protect. And this is exactly what Jesus does for us. Um, I, I, I shared this story, I, I think it was a number of years ago, um, but I think it'll illustrate my, my point today. Uh, I'm the youngest of eight kids. Uh, my dad had eight children, seven boys, one girl. She, yeah, kind of awful for her. <laughs> um, seven boys, 
one girl, I'm, I'm the baby. There's a pretty significant age gap between me and my oldest brother. My oldest brother actually passed away uh, in COVID, from COVID, uh, kind of early on. And uh, he had a very hard life, uh, very hard life. Um, struggled with alcoholism. And uh, when he was sober, he was the nicest guy. But when he got that bottle in his hand, he just became someone else. And um, he just made some really foolish decisions in his life. And uh, most of my childhood, I have these memories of going to the jail to visit him. One long stint, he was in prison. And, but there was this moment when I was really young that uh, what he did was he decided that he was going to rob a convenience store. And so he did this. He robbed the convenience store and then later got caught and arrested. And he was in court for his hearing and my dad showed up that day, and what he wanted to do is he wanted to post bail uh, on his behalf. And so when he went in there on that day to try to do this, the judge responded and just said, why? Like, like how do you know that he's learned his lesson? How do you know that he won't just turn around and do this exact same thing again? Why would you do this? And my dad gave a very simple and profound answer. He just said, because he's my son. Now, we can argue all day long on whether or not that was the wisest decision for my dad to make on that day, but what we cannot argue is that might be a perfect picture of what Jesus does for us daily. Daily. L listen to this. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. It says this. My dear children, I write this to you so that you do not sin. But if anybody does sin, if anybody does lie, if anybody does cheat, if anybody does rob a convenience store, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, listen. Here's the plain truth. There is bad news. Okay? Here's the bad news. We've all sinned. Okay, we've all done the things we know we shouldn't do. We don't do the things that we know that we should do. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Okay, and so if you picture in the courtroom of eternity, we stand convicted. We stand guilty. We stand shackled in chains, unable to set ourselves free. That's the bad news. Now here's the good news, <laughs> the good news is that we have an advocate. We have a defender. We have one who will speak up when we can't speak up and who will stand up when we can't stand up. His name is Jesus. Maybe the best way of saying it is this, that 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, he went there to post bail on our behalf. He's not just our provider. He's our defender. In fact, he's our only defense. When I die and I stand before the Lord, I'm not going to say, well, I did this and I did this, and I did this. Look how good I am. That's not my defense. My only defense on that day, your only defense on that day is to say, yeah, I'm with Jesus. I'm with Jesus, my advocate, my defender. That's how we get in. He is not just our provider. He is our defender. And then here's my third point. My third point is this, that he rejoices over us. Uh, to be honest, th this point, for me, it's easy for me to know it here and harder for me to accept it here. He rejoices over us. You know, I think about my kids. If all I ever did for them was forgive them when they mess up and provide for them, man, something would be missing. Something would, would just be missing in that relationship. Like, 
Like, like, listen, if I can just say it this way, like the highlight of my week is not when I pay for groceries to feed my kids. I know for some of you, that's like, woohoo, Zares! Yeah, it's just not the highlight of my week, right? In fact, my wife actually does most of the shopping for us. But like, like I, I, but that's a vital part of my job, right? We provide. But that's, that, that's not the highlight. You, you, you wanna know, I, th- I think of my kids, Nora and Bo, like, like, my favorite moments are when there's a song on and I will pick up my daughter and we will just dance in the middle of the room. My, my, my son right now loves wrestling with me. Like, loves it. And just, Daddy, can we wrestle? And it starts with a football tackle and then we just get on the ground and roll around and laugh hysterically. But it's in those moments that there is an intimacy that is felt. And in the same way that I experience an intimacy with my children, this is how God views us. And that's hard for me sometimes to, again, I I can understand it here, but it's here that, that sometimes I struggle. But I just want you to listen to the scripture, Zephaniah 3.17. It says this, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Oh, this is so good, Parkwood. We have an everlasting father who actually delights in us. But so often the time, you, 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 you wanna know what my mind defaults to? you know, probably many of us, is that sometimes we think that the posture of God towards us is arms folded, full of regret. He's just kind of like this distant God up there somewhere looking down on us, and he's like, come on, you fell down again? That's not the posture of God at all. He looks down on his children and rejoices. Like he delights in us. I, I, I think about, I, I heard a pastor years ago use this analogy and it always stuck with me. If you are a parent in the room, you'll, you'll understand this moment. But remember those moments when our kids were, were really young and they were learning to walk for the very first time. Like, like go back to that moment in your mind, Okay. Remember that moment where all of a sudden they, they took that first wobbly step and, and then another one, right? And then what eventually happened was their head was two times too big for their body. Gravity took over and they fell. <laughs> and in that moment, let me tell you what no parent has ever said. No parent has ever looked at their child when they fell in that moment and said, come on, get up, Billy. No. Because that's not the heart of the Father. What, what, what happens in those moments, we see them take one step, two step, fall. What do we do? We rejoice. We pick them back up again, set them up, and let's try this again. Let's go for three steps. And they fall, and we pick. Like, that is the heart of God towards you. Like right now, somebody needs to hear this right here. God sees you as is, loves you as is, saves you as is, and rejoices over you as is. This is the heart of the Father. And yeah, he loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us there. He wants to walk with us and he wants us to grow and he wants us to mature so when we fall like a good parent, he picks us back up. Let's go again, let's get a little bit further. But the heart of God, the heart of the Father is not arms crossed. Are you kidding me? You you did that? You said that, you watched that, you partook in that, you smoked that, you drank that, no. The heart of God is let's get back up. Let's get back up and try this again. Why? Because you are his child and he rejoices over you. 
And Jesus reiterates Zephaniah's teaching in a parable of his own. We don't read it, it's Luke 15, but it's, man, just recently, I, I've been so captivated by this very popular parable. It's the, the parable of the lost sons. We know it, right? The, the one son gets the inheritance early, walks away, squanders every last cent on wild, licentious living. Just loses it all. Comes to his senses and says, well, my dad's not gonna take me back home, but maybe if he brings me back as a servant on his property, that would be better than life right now. So he rehearses this speech and he's on his way home and the father sees his son at a distance. And you wanna know what the father doesn't do? He doesn't fold his arms. And say, really? He's back for more? I can't, no. That's, that's not what the father does. The father runs to meet him, throws his arms around him, calls in his servant, get, get a robe and a ring and let's, let's, let's kill a fattened calf and let's celebrate. And the whole story ends in this large celebration. Why? Because it is the heart of the father to rejoice over his children. We stand up in this room. <clears throat> Park, what I want you to see this morning that as we inch our way towards Christmas, that Christmas is more than chestnuts roasting over an open fire or Jack Frost nipping at our nose. It's more than jingle bells and holiday smells and kissing under the mistletoe. No, 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 it's about Jesus coming into the world to reveal to us the forever fatherly heart of God. This Christmas, there is hope. And the hope is this, that no matter how awesome or awful your biological father was, in or is, in Jesus, we have something better. We have someone better. There is hope this morning. We have an everlasting father who never leaves us, never forsakes us, always forgives us protects us, provides for us, defends us. And yes, he looks down on you right now and rejoices over you. This is what we see through Jesus at Christmas. He truly is our everlasting Father.